Okay, good morning, good evening, afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the, the third seminar in this uh, tree mortality series of the International Tree Mortality Network. Uh, we're really excited to have Belinda Medlin with us today to tell us about uh, tree mortality in Australian ecosystems. Um, but just before we launch into her talk, just want to take two minutes um, for those of you who might not be aware um, of what the network does, just to give you a quick introduction. Um, so the idea of the Tree Mortality Network is a community initiative and its aim is to bring together people from across the world and from a variety of different disciplines, from remote sensing, forest inventory, um, computer modeling, ecophysiologists, um, to try and understand better the causes of, of tree mortality. So trends in tree mortality and the causes at the global scale. Um, so we are, well, we come out of the IUFRO task force um, on tree mortality and then the International Tree Mortality Network sits within that. You can see here um, the group of core people it's sitting in the middle of the initiative, but it's much more than that. It's a, it's a community um, supported by a scientific advisory board. Um, we run these mortality webinars every four to eight weeks. And the idea um, is that they just help bring people together and that they also um, showcase some of the exciting research that's been done in this area. And if you have suggestions for topics you'd like to be covered, um, for people, um, if you want to put yourself forward, um, please just contact us at the email address you can see on the screen. Um, likewise, if you're looking around and you see some exciting papers on tree mortality, please do tweet them to our account or use the hashtag that you can see just highlighted there on the screen. Um, so onto today's webinar, um, Belinda's gonna talk for about 45 minutes. After that, we have a 15 minute question and answer session. Um, Please use the question and answer function to ask questions at any time. You'll find this um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, please don't put questions in the chat, put them in the question and answer session in question and answer function. At the end of the webinar, then we'll sort through the questions and take a selection of those to put to Belinda. Um, we apologize if your question isn't selected. Uh, it's nothing personal. We just haven't got time perhaps for everything. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, please put them in the chat. So to reiterate, questions in the question and answer function and technical stuff in the chat. So that's enough from me. So I'm super happy to uh, be introducing distinguished professor Belinda Medlin from Western Sydney University, um, as well as being one of and at the world experts in ecosystem modeling and forest modeling. She's also the theme leader for ecosystem function and integration at Western Sydney University. She's the holder of a very prestigious Australian Research Council Laureate Fellowship. And she is the instigator of the fantastically named Dead Tree Detective. So I'll hand over to Belinda um, to tell you all about tree mortality in Australian ecosystems. Great. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, and thanks for inviting me along to give this talk. Um, so uh, before I begin, um, I would uh, just like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which I work and live. So this photograph, for example, uh, is taken from Cain's Flat, which is on Wiradjuri land. Um, out near Mudgee. Um, and this photograph was taken uh, in about January um, 2020, January 2020. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about where this photograph comes from um, in a little minute. Um, so, oops, hang on, sorry, there we go. This seminar is going to be quite unashamedly Australian focused. Um, I want to talk about tree mortality in Australian ecosystems. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to think not, oh, that's not interesting because Australian ecosystems are just weird, but more that is super interesting because Australian ecosystems are living in an environment 
um, which can really help us to think about what trees might face in, eco in climatic conditions of the future. Um, the forests that we have um, are really diverse. Um, so just to introduce you to some of the forest types briefly, we have rainforests, um, we have tall wet forests. Um, so some of the eucalypt forests are um, among the tallest in the world um, and highly productive. Um, we have a lot of deciduous sclerophyllous forests, dry sclerophyll forests, sorry, not deciduous, um, dry sclerophyll forests, um, savannas, tropical savannas, Mali ecosystems, which are these short um, multi-stemmed trees, um, and semi-arid woodlands, which reach out into the, into the semi-arid centre. So you can see rainfall um, is a really determining factor in these different types of ecosystems. We cover a really broad rainfall gradient and that really shapes um, the ecosystems that we have. Um, another really important shaping factor is the variability in rainfall. Um, so the Australian rainfall patterns are not only um, cover a huge gradient, they're also typically much more variable than you would find in other regions of the world. So um, I haven't seen an update on this figure since 1997, but this gives you an idea of the relative rainfall variability um, across Australia compared to um, global uh, relationships, looking at places with similar mean annual rainfall elsewhere. Um, so we do have a high variation, interannual variation in rainfall. Um, and that was captured in a very famous and well-known Australian poem by Dorothea McKellar, who talks about droughts and flooding rains. Um, and you'll, you'll see that phrase often in papers from Australia. What that looks like on the ground, um, this is the rainfall record from our campus in Western Sydney. Um, so this is the two year running mean of, of rainfall. Um, and so the point that I wanted to highlight from this over the last century um, is that actually the mean rainfall doesn't happen very often at all. Mostly we're in pretty severe droughts or in pretty severe wet seasons. Um, and so we kind of lurch from, from droughts to, to, uh, to wets um, over, the, over the decades. Um, and there have frequently been really dry excursions over the last century. Um, and I'm just highlighting some of those here. What that means is that we are, or Australian ecosystems are no stranger to drought mortality. Um, and so I've, I've put together a little bit of a snapshot of, of what's happened um, over this last century, um, starting with the Federation drought. So the Federation drought um, occurred around the time of Australian Federation when uh, we became a country. Um, and uh, you can see that at that time, um, the rainfall was really in one of those very dry periods. Um, and so this is kind of one of the, the shaping droughts of Australian um, settlement, I guess. Um, uh, a group from CSIRO went back to the newspaper records from the time and tried to extract wherever they could information about impacts on ecosystems. And they covered all different types of organisms. Um, but this map is where I've, I've extracted from their data set all the dead tree records that they found in newspapers of the time. And so you can see that there's a lot of um, quite graphic descriptions of thousands of trees dying, miles and miles of bush timber being dead. Um, and so we know that um, fairly wide scale drought mortality has happened um, in the past, in past droughts. Um, there was also, there was another big drought around the time of World War II, very few records um, at that time for obvious reasons. Um, scientific studies of the drought impacts seem to start around the 1960s, um, which was also a dry period, not outstandingly dry in Eastern Australia, but whoops, dry, uh, dry enough 
um, for um, patches of dead vegetation to start appearing on the hill slopes above Canberra. Um, and for scientists to get out there and start making the first measurements of what relative water content looked like in these trees um, as, they, as they died. Um, moving forward in the 70s and 80s, um, a lot of the literature is dominated by work on rural dieback. Um, and you can see a photograph here taken uh, from a paper by Meg Lohman and Hal Heatwall documenting what that rural dieback looks like. So in the 70s and 80s, um, particularly um, in New South Wales um, on the New England tableland, there was a massive loss of trees. So the landscape really changed because they lost a lot of these, these paddock trees. Um, finding the climatic conditions that caused this was not straightforward. So you can see at this time, it wasn't obviously dry, there was a hypothesis that it was the swing from conditions from wet to dry that started off um, a cycle of dieback. Um, and the papers at the time have quite a complicated um, series of hypotheses around what leads to that dieback, which include um, rainfall extremes. Um, so there's a climatic factor, but there's also um, a lot of interactions with disturbance, so competition with pasture crops, for example, um, improvement of pastures, and then there's an interaction with the insects. So what they were seeing was a large increase in populations of leaf feeding insects, and that kind of gradually put the nail in the coffin for those trees. Um, fast forwarding um, further, we come to the millennium drought, which was in the first decade of this century, um, which was a really, um, again, defining feature in the way that we think about Australian ecosystems. It was a very long, um, prolonged drought lasted for um, actually about 10 years. Um, this uh, map is, is just focusing on the, the driest period of the millennium drought, but you can see how far below average we were um, during that six year period. The interesting thing about the millennium drought is that actually not very many reports of tree death filtered through. Um, so I've looked quite exhaustively now and talked to a lot of people about what died. Um, and the things that died are principally plantations, particularly plantations that hadn't been very well managed, like unthinned Pinus radiata plantations, um, there were some blue gum plantations, which were probably ill-advised to begin with. Um, there was mortality in floodplain forests um, along the banks of some of the more regulated rivers, which kind of makes sense because a lot of those rivers were over extracted during the drought. Um, but once you get away from the rivers, there was really not very much um, tree death. One exception being um, a dieback of Eucalyptus femalalis um, around south of Canberra, um, which again was more like the rural dieback. It seemed like it had more causes than just the climatic factors. Um, so it didn't seem like there was a lot of tree death, but one of the issues that we had was that we didn't know whether that was just people weren't paying attention um, and tree death was occurring and it just wasn't being reported or whether it actually wasn't occurring. We did go and look in the remotely sensed record to see if we could find evidence for tree death. Um, so this is work done by a PhD student from Clark University in the US, Tong Zhao, um, where she looked at um, several different indicators from the remotely sensed record, including FPAR um, and the vegetation optical density and tried to see whether she could match excursions of anomalies of those um, indicators with observations of tree death, the handful of observations of tree death that we had. Um, and although there was, um, although there was obvious variation in those remote sensing indices with the rainfall and water balance um, anomalies, um, there wasn't a clear signal of tree mortality as such. So it was actually impossible to pick out whether tree death was occurring or whether this was just 
kind of natural cycles of um, uh, vegetation um, coming and going with rainfall. Um, so in the absence of data, we decided to set up this citizen science website um, using the tools provided by the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, on the thought that perhaps we could harness, um, you know, people who were out there on the ground um, to get some photographs of what actually was happening, particularly during drought. Um, and as it turned out, we set this up um, at just uh, a propitious moment. Um, so we started it in the middle of 2018. Um, and from 2018, we went into um, one of the um, most sharp and severe droughts that we've seen in a very long time. So the millennium drought was long, but it wasn't really harsh. Um, similarly, federation drought, long, but not harsh. Whereas the, um, the lack of rainfall that we had, as well as the high temperatures that we had over the, over the three years from 2017 through to early 2020, um, was really, really severe. And we, we got plenty of records from people out on the ground, um, which started, um, started coming through from Southern Queensland initially, and then kind of gradually moved south um, as the year progressed. Um, there were several different types of records that we received. Some of them were um, occasions where you saw really sudden browning of the canopy. So this is an example from out near Goulburn where the person's gone past and gone, goodness, this is, this is suddenly gone very brown. All the leaves have just crisped up. Um, there were also more long-term declines that were being reported. So this is one from Southern Victoria where the person is kind of reporting on something that's been happening over several years, but seemed to be exacerbated during the drought. Um, so um, that was all very depressing. Um, but the interesting thing over the past year has been the records of recovery. So this is an example from someone uh, again on the hill slopes of Canberra. So the first photograph is taken in April after it had just started to rain again. And you can see the canopy is, you know, completely crisped. Um, things are looking really quite sad. Um, but this is a photograph that she sent me very recently showing the recovery of the canopy after, um, after rainfall. So there is quite a remarkable capacity um, of many different types of forests to recover um, after these severe droughts. Um, so there's kind of a potted history of the types of dieback and death that we've looked at over the last century. It's tempting to think that because drought mortality has happened in the past, therefore Australian systems must be resilient and they'll be able to be resilient in the future. And you do see that a lot um, in the, you know, Australian popular culture. There's an idea out there that we, you know, we've coped with drought before, we'll do it again, she'll be right. Um, but to my way of thinking, this actually really highlights the vulnerability that we're at, that we're already got ecosystems which are under stress. Um, and when the droughts and heat waves get more extreme, then that stress will become more extreme. And we do have a real question of whether they will be able to keep bouncing back in the same way. Um, and certainly we are seeing, um, it's hard to detect trends in rainfall against that background variability. But the thing that is clearly shifting very dramatically is the, the heat. Um, so the frequency of extreme heat events over the past century from the latest CSIRO State of the Climate Report is quite startling. Um, and certainly this is our lived experience as well, that um, the number of heat waves and the high heat days have dramatically increased. Not so much this year, this year has been blissfully normal, um, but over the past five years, we've seen a lot of um, uh, really high heat days. Um, and um, I haven't had time to pull them all together, but there are ongoing diebacks being studied in every state and territory across Australia. So we have a kind of network that's coming together, um, which is looking at different diebacks from Western Australia through to Tasmania. Um, and in every region of Australia, there are episodes of ongoing dieback which 
tend to emphasize and underline this, this vulnerability. So um, one of the things that we are really trying quite urgently to do um, is to try and make predictions about where and when and what species are going to experience dieback next so that we are in a position um, to be prepared, um, plan and adapt. Um, and so um, in the next um, few slides, few slides, haha, um, I want to talk a bit about the um, work that we've been doing attempting to predict mortality. Um, and most of that work so far has really focused on understanding um, embolism, hydraulic failure. And one of the reasons that we're looking um, specifically at hydraulic failure is that we think we have really quite good evidence now that this is the main process that's involved, at least in that acute canopy failure. And so we think that that is definitely something that is predictable. Um, and so um, this work has been done with a, a, a team of people across uh, Western Sydney um, and University of New South Wales. Um, it focuses on the idea of, of hydraulic failure, as I mentioned, and I, I probably don't need to explain to this audience what hydraulic failure is, um, but just in case, uh, my colleague Brendan Choate has this really nice illustration of what happens during hydraulic failure. Um, so what's happening is that the water is being transported through the stem from the roots to the leaves, um, uh, in the xylem of the tree, it's under stress as the, the, uh, the water potential in the soil drops, that stress becomes larger in the stems and causes them to embolize, to get air bubbles in them. So these beautiful pictures from Brendan's group show that process of embolism um, ending in catastrophic uh, xylem failure. So these plants are no longer able to transport water. Um, and so we think we understand that process. Um, and what's more, we're fairly sure that that is the process that underpins that canopy browning that we have seen. Um, and so one reason we're fairly confident about that is that my wonderful colleague, Rachel Nolan and her team um, have studied one of these uh, events during this um, black summer drought that we had. Um, what they did was to go out, find a bunch of study sites um, up in New England um, and find different, three different species of eucalypt in states where they had dead canopies, low canopy stress or still full canopies, um, cut sections of stem and look at the percent loss of conductivity um, in the stems from uh, the different severity classes. And so what she's, she, they have found um, in this paper that's just been accepted um, the other day in New Phytologist um, is the really striking increase in percent loss of conductivity across the classes of trees. So the low stress ones had a low percent loss of conductivity, the dying dead ones were really pushing um, 80, 90% um, loss of conductivity. So we're fairly sure that that's what's behind that canopy browning. Um, and that gives us the confidence to go ahead and try and use our understanding of those processes to try and predict um, when and where that might occur. And so the way that we think about this is to divide um, drought stress into kind of two phases. The first phase is where you have stomatal closure. And the second phase is where you have that loss of hydraulic conductance. Um, and so the loss of hydraulic conductance, we typically characterize by the water potentials um, at different um, points on this loss of conductance curve. Um, the the Xi 50, um, 50 percent loss of hydraulic conductivity um, is one uh, really good measure. Um, of the water stress that different species can cope with. Um, and one thing that's um, coming up again and again, very clearly as we look at species across this rainfall, this wonderful rainfall gradient that we have um, in Australia, is that that um, 
that indicator that Xi50 varies really quite systematically with the climate of origin of different species. So this study was led by a PhD student, Chi Ming Li. Um, he looked at 12 different species um, taken from a rainfall gradient across New South Wales, ranging through those different types of um, forests that I talked about at the start from rainforest through to the semi-arid woodlands. Um, and you can see that P50 um, really varies very closely with the mean annual precipitation of those ecosystems. More than that, um, what Lee was able to show was that stomata closure seemed to occur in time to prevent the onset of embolism. So across all of the different species that he had, um, he looked at stomatal closure as a function of leaf water potential and the onset of hydraulic conductance loss um, as a function of leaf water potential. Um, and looked at the point of stomatal closure being 90% stomatal closed and the onset of hydraulic failure being the 12% loss of conductivity. And they sit pretty much on the one-to-one -one line, um, which tells us that across this suite of species, um, they're all shutting their stomata in time to um, prevent the onset of xylem embolism. Um, and that's, that, uh, that observation um, has been really helpful in developing or improving, um, I, would, I would actually say, you know, a, a, a quantum leap in our ability to predict stomatal behaviour. Um, so um, a lot of the stomatal modelling um, prior to about 2015 um, looked at this idea that stomatal conductance was a trade-off between carbon gain and the water used. And this idea was uh, originated by Cowan and Farquhar in the 70s. Um, and they came up with this idea that stomata should um, be regulated to maximise photosynthetic uptake, less the cost of water used to do photosynthesis. Um, and there's a parameter in there, lambda, which people have argued about for a long time. It represents the cost of water to the plant. But what does that actually mean? There's a lot of discussion in the literature um, about what that lambda parameter could actually represent. Um, but in the last five years, there's been, um, I guess, a flurry of research thinking about, okay, maybe that cost of water is related to that cost of loss of hydraulic conductance. Um, and so I think this idea was first published by Wolf in 2016, um, where they proposed that um, stomata should be regulated to maximise photosynthesis, less a function of leaf water potential. Um, and then there are various different versions of this. We published one with another student, Yaoji Lu, um, which, uh, in which we assumed that stomata were maximising photosynthesis less um, a cost associated with the percent loss of conductivity. Um, John Sperry and group also published a, um, a, a similar model, even more intriguing. I'm not gonna go into the details of these models here because that's another whole seminar. Um, I will flag that um, another PhD student, Manon Sabot, um, is working on a paper which um, is comparing these different models and trying to understand which, of, which approach really reflects best um, the observations that we have of stomatal closure during drought. So look out for that one. Um, there's a number of challenges to predicting stomatal closure, even with these new models. And I'll just highlight a couple of them here. One of them is that we have paid probably too little attention to the fact that the apparent photosynthetic capacity declines as well. So it's not just about stomatal closure. The VC max, the apparent VC max, also declines with soil water potential. Um, and that's been shown over and over again. It's very clear in every data set that we've ever looked at. Um, recently, uh, my PhD student, Jinyan Yang, looked at the effect of high VPD um, on uh, VC max and actually found that there's, there seems to be an impact of high VPD on apparent VC max as well. Um, 
I'm still looking for other data sets that can confirm that impact. Um, but this is something that we do need to take account of um, in our stomatal models. And as far as I'm aware, the work by Roddy Dewar and Anarchy Makula is still probably the only model that takes that effect into account. Um, heat waves. Heat waves um, are, as I mentioned earlier, something that um, is really changing the way that ecosystems function in Australia because of the increased prevalence of high temperatures. Um, and we are aware that um, the response of trees during heat waves is somewhat different to the response of trees during droughts without associated heat waves. Um, and so um, this example um, is taken from a study done with the whole tree chambers um, on our campus in Western Sydney. Um, an experiment led by John Drake um, was supposed to look at the heat waves of the future. And what we did was to expose the trees to four days in a row of 43 degrees. Um, has to be said that we've had similar heat waves since then. So the future was very quick in coming. Um, nonetheless, this experiment was really interesting because in these whole tree chambers, we can measure the fluxes, the carbon and water fluxes of the canopy on a 15 minutely time scale. And so um, it enabled us to get a really clear picture of what was happening with photosynthesis and transpiration under these high temperatures without some poor sod having to be there um, taking erga measurements in 43 degree heat. Um, and what we found was really quite intriguing that under the heat wave conditions, um, canopy photosynthesis pretty much went to zero. Um, and if you follow the optimal stomatal conductance idea, that would argue that the stomata should also shut. But what we saw was that the transpiration rates continued unchanged. So it was basically no difference in transpiration between our control trees and our heat wave trees. And so our theory about this is that it is one of the key mechanisms that the trees use to keep their leaves cool during heat waves. Um, and that's not something that's built into the optimal stomatal models, but seems to be an important um, feature of the way that trees work during heat waves. Um, uh, and so this need to use water to cool the canopy during high temperatures can really exacerbate the impact of drought. And we certainly saw that during the black summer drought. Um, where the dry conditions were accompanied by really high temperatures um, and that canopy crisping was more likely to occur when those high temperatures were happening. Um, so heat waves, um, one important factor. Another really important point um, which we all wrestle with, I guess, is understanding what's going on below ground and how much water the trees have access to. So in our heat wave experiment, our trees had not been watered for a month. Um, so they, in theory, um, didn't have much water in the topsoil. But um, typically, um, uh, eucalypt species have quite deep roots. And so it takes certainly a lot longer than a month to deplete the soil moisture profile. Um, and I just showed this data set because <laughs> I love it so much. Um, this is a, a data set um, of soil moisture content below the ambient rings in our uke face experiment. Um, first published by Teresa Jimeno um, in 2018, um, but recently used by Meng Huan Mu um, in a paper in Hess, where she was trying to use these data to uh, calibrate the cable model. So to ensure that it could represent what was happening um, in the soil moisture store. Um, two points about this data set that really stand out is that interannual variation in soil moisture availability to these trees. So you can see these um, long dry periods interspersed with, you know, a year and a half of wet followed by a really long dry period during our black summer drought where soil moisture is disappearing um, at depth 
So there's a big depletion below a metre, but also more depletion around the three metre mark. So um, we know that uh, the trees typically have access to soil moisture stores at depth, um, depending on what the soil type is. And so representing that soil moisture store and that rooting depth is one of, is one of the tricky really tricky things that we um, have to grapple with if we're going to try and predict um, uh, drought stress across Australian ecosystems. Um, so that's phase one, thinking about stomatal closure. Phase two, um, post-stomatal closure. So the way that we think about what happens after the stomata have closed is that we assume that the plants are actually hydraulically isolated from the soil. So as the soil continues to dry, the water potential will drop and drop and drop and the plants don't want that to happen. So they basically um, cut off the connection with the soil. And so they're, they're really dependent on the water that they have stored in the tissues. And that water is gradually lost through cuticular conductance rather than stomatal conductance. Um, and we try to predict the time from stomatal closure to hydraulic failure, um, based on this uh, equation that was introduced originally by Chris Blackman in 2016, um, where he argued that the time to critical hydraulic failure um, could be calculated by thinking about how much water there was in the plant um, and how long it would take to deplete based on the prevailing VPD, the cuticular conductance and the leaf area. And so we tried to test this model using data from Lee's experiment. Um, one thing that we had to grapple with was the loss of leaf area over time. Um, and so what Lee and Chris observed in all of their species, as they dried them down, leaves were shed. Um, and so uh, this is the leaf shedding on individual plants um, as the water potential falls. Um, and interestingly, the onset of leaf shedding correlates roughly with the P50 um, across those, that suite of species that they were looking at. Um, so we needed to change the equation to take into account the fact that the trees were losing leaf area and therefore losing um, or conserving, conserving water by shedding leaves. Um, okay, so the next slide, um, grieves me a little bit to present. When we first tested this model against the data from uh, Lee and Chris's experiment, we found that it worked really well. Um, and we were really happy about that um, and published our paper very happily. Um, and it wasn't until several months later when we were working on a different paper that we discovered an error had been made. Um, one set of data had leaf area on a projected basis and one set of data had it on a total basis. So there was a factor of two. Um, and you know, if I have one thing, one piece of advice for PhD students, if ever I'm asked, what's your main piece of advice? It's always check your units, check them really well because that sort of error creeps in so easily. Um, and it does change the conclusions that you make. So instead of predicting um, the time to hydraulic failure really well, we now find that our model actually under predicts the time to hydraulic failure. Um, and so we're estimating that it is too rapid, um, uh, which it nonetheless predicts the variance across species, um, but there's obviously more to it than just thinking about what water, available, what water is available um, in the plant and what rate it's depleted at. Nonetheless, Nonetheless, despite all these caveats and complicating factors, um, we can still make plausible predictions about um, the onset of drought mortality. So this is work that was led by my wonderful colleague, Martin Decau, um, where he implemented these ideas into the cable land surface model and tried to predict uh, hydraulic failure during first the millennium drought and the black summer drought um, and compared it to the percent reduction in vegetation optical depth over the same period. Um, and at this scale, the southeastern Australian scale, 
Um, these predictions of the percent loss of hydraulic conductivity are plausible. Um, and so this gives us a lot of hope. We've still got a lot of details to work on, um, but we think that we're headed in the right direction to be able to predict where and when we might see hydraulic failure. Um, of course, that's not where the story stops because of this recovery that we've been seeing. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, after it started raining at the start of 2020, um, a lot of the people who had been sending me photographs of dead trees in a you know, really upset state started sending me photographs like this one on the left showing um, epicormic re-sprouting. So the trees were starting to recover pretty much as soon as it started raining again. Some of the trees have pretty much fully recovered. Over the past year, we've had a lot of rain, it's been really cool and they've been able to recover. Not all of them by, by any means. Um, and um, just because a tree is re-sprouting doesn't mean it's gonna survive. So this is an example um, of one that's, you know, it started to re-sprout, but it doesn't look like it's gonna make it. It doesn't look like it has the reserves to be able to rebuild uh, its canopy and its xylem after that drought stress that it's been through. Um, and so this, this process of recovery is a really intriguing one. And I think one that we really need to focus on being able to quantify and to model. Um, as I mentioned, it recovers not, it involves not only just building new leaves, but also building new xylem. Um, and so this is some work from one of Brendan Choate's PhD students, Alice Gorty, um, who's been looking at um, recovery after drought stress. Um, and she's got some really nice images which demonstrate that once, um, once the plants lose their leaves, to recover after that really does involve rebuilding new xylem. Um, so it's not like they can recover the embolized xylem, they need to rebuild. Um, that is expensive in terms of carbon. Um, so they, these, these pictures are not a drought stress event, it's an insect stress event, um, but I think they really nicely illustrate the cost of rebuilding. So these photographs were taken before and after uh, a canopy was reflushed after an insect attack by my colleague Sebastian Fouch. The little blue dots are the starch granules in the sapwood of the tree. And you can see the dramatic drawdown of starch before um, or during that flush. So my thought is that to predict the capacity of trees to recover, we do need to think about carbon stores. How much does the plant have in terms of carbon stores and how much does it need to rebuild? Um, and I find this kind of ironic in a way because um, a lot of the drought mortality literature has focused on this hydraulic failure versus carbon starvation dichotomy that Nate McDowell put forward um, in his fantastic work in the 2000s, 2008. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of work going into showing that carbohydrate reserves don't actually matter during drought. So if a plant's gonna die during drought stress, it's most likely to die from hydraulic failure. However, I think we need to go back and look at these carbohydrate reserves because actually that's what's gonna determine whether the plant survives long-term. So if they don't have the carbohydrate reserves, then they may not be able to recover once it starts raining again. And so there may yet be death down the track. Um, I just want to finish with a couple of thoughts about high CO2 because this is an argument that we have quite frequently um, amongst my group of colleagues. What is the role of rising CO2 in delaying drought stress and drought mortality? Um, and I think we can think about it in those three phases. So there is the capacity for elevated CO2 to delay stomatal closure and to um, delay plant stress um, in that initial phase of drought. And we have a new paper that just came out in New Phytologist led by Ming Kai Zhang, um, finally getting a 10 year old data set out there, which demonstrates um, 
at high CO2, that's the red ones um, in this graph, the leaf water, the pre-dawn leaf water potential um, in our high CO2 plants was significantly higher um, through the course of a drought. Um, the way, even though, even though the plants were much bigger under high CO2. So there is evidence that stomatal closure, um, uh, that phase can be less stressful under high CO2. Um, there's, I guess, less evidence to date that that phase two is affected by high CO2. And indeed, it's hard to see what the mechanism would be um, for there to be a CO2 effect on that, that desiccation phase when the plant is, is drying out. Um, and I put here some data from a paper from Hong Lang Duan in 2018 that my colleague David Tissue specifically requested me to talk about, um, demonstrating that the leaf water potential um, during the drought two mortality in this experiment um, was not uh, alleviated by, by high CO2 and certainly the time to mortality um, was no different. But I would also point out um, that there was higher non-structural carbohydrate under high CO2 in this experiment. And that higher non-structural carbohydrate reserve could potentially give the plants the capacity to recover better. So, you know, um, it would be really interesting. Here's a great experiment someone needs to do to look at recovery after drought and whether that is actually um, facilitated by high CO2. Um, so I am just going to wrap up now. So there's a, there's, I guess there's, there's been a lot in this seminar. Um, there's a lot to think about, um, but we really, um, we do have a task ahead of us. I think we've made a lot of progress over the last decade, but there's clearly, you know, a lot more work to be done before we can make confident predictions about where and when trees might die and where they might recover. Um, but I'm really, really grateful to a number of fantastic colleagues um, who've helped me over the last, well, who I've worked with um, over the last decade on this research. Um, and I'll, I'll finish with, uh, with that list of thanks and ask for questions. Well, thank you so much, Belinda. So I am the one who uh, um, um, is moderating the questions, and I have to say, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I personally would have a number and the really, really inspiring talk here, but I'm basically the vessel who relays the questions from the Q and A uh, uh, thread. And uh, there is one by Nate, Nate McDowell, um, I'm zooming in on the on the mechanisms. You know, you showed uh, fairly tight relationships between VC max and uh, a number of indicators like VPT or CPT. Uh, and so the question uh, that Nate posed uh, was, uh, can you speculate on the mechanisms? So do you have any ideas what the mechanisms are behind those, uh, or what the processes are behind those relationships? Yeah, so, I mean, our best guess, that's, that's apparent photosynthetic capacity. It's an apparent VC max. It doesn't mean it's the rubisco activity. Um, there is a role for mesophyll conductance in that VC max. Um, and although we haven't actually pulled apart the contribution of actual rubisco activity versus mesophyll conductance, the decline, if we, if we figure out, you know, how much mesophyll conductance would have to decline for that decline in, in VC max to occur, it's plausible. So that, that potentially is the main mechanism that there is a, a reduction in mesophyll conductance as well. Um, that in itself though is really interesting because what causes that? Um, and I'm still questioning in my mind whether that is um, a constraint or a feature. So, you know, is it something like the plant is also reducing its mesophyll conductance at the same time as it reduces its stomatal conductance or is the mesophyll conductance reduction, you know, um, something that the plant has to cope with? Very, very exciting. Um, really cool. Thanks for the answer. Um, so uh, a second question, more of a phenomenological one, but I think important for many of us to understand some of the things that you've uh, been showing uh, was how hot were these heat wave days actually? I think you mentioned at some point that the, the 43 that you 
that you post experimentally were actually reached, uh, but it would be probably nice to just uh, give us a few more details on, uh, on, on the heat waves and the combined drought and heat that you guys have been experiencing. Yeah, oh, I wish I had one of those slides handy. Um, but we've, I guess we've got to the point where 40 degrees isn't actually that hot anymore. It's, it's when it starts hitting, you know, 47, 48, 49, that uh, we, we're kind of thinking, oh, geez, it's hot. Um, so particularly during that, that, um, that, that black summer drought, we were well into the 40s on a number of days. Pretty hot indeed. Um, there's another one uh, from Nate, uh, um, picking up on the recovery, uh, uh, on the recovery story. And um, um, actually also, I, I personally also was quite intrigued by that one. Uh, and the question is, um, um, it, it seems that uh, um, a, a, quite a number of the trees in, in Australia only see die back in drought. So only part of the canopy dying and they eventually uh, bounce back or are able to bounce back uh, versus uh, a full tree death or really die off. Off. Um, so uh, do you have any, any, any numbers or, or rough uh, estimates on what the percentage is of the trees that actually die in the drought and those that uh, are able to come back? We're trying to get some numbers on that. Um, so my colleague, colleagues, Rachel Nolan and Brendan Choate, have been um, leading surveys. You know, it's been very challenging over the past year to get out into the field, of course, but they're doing the best they can to get some numbers on um, what fraction of the trees are able to recover. Um, during the drought, um, we would often see trees which lost their whole canopy. So um, that, hang on, I don't know if I can go backwards. Um, this one with, sorry, bear with me. Um, where's Sheila's photo gone? This one. So this was kind of common that you would see this whole canopy that would go brown. So it wasn't like, you know, some, sometimes trees would, there'd be, you know, one branch that went brown more than another branch, but you would often see the whole tree would, would brown off um, at the same time. Um, so it's it's not it's not actually necessarily bit by bit. It can be the whole tree that goes at once. Thanks for that. Um, there's another question by uh, Simon Lawson, and he asks, um, um, you know, t continuing with the recovery theme here a little bit, um, the the if the the carbohydrate reserves are important to uh, to predict recovery. I mean, is there a way to uh, uh, you know, use these reserves or the knowledge about these reserves to predict whether they will. And then the, the, sort of the follow up is in a way, uh, um, is there evidence that, you know, as these uh, um, climatic conditions are, are, are becoming more severe, that these reserves are sort of showing a tendency of just running lower and lower in a way, and I guess uh, depleting their uh, um, ability to recover? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, so, Yes, to the first part of the question. I think, unfortunately, the non-structural carbohydrate measurements are quite challenging, particularly to do them in the places where they matter. So the reserves in the leaves are less important because obviously those leaves are going to be shed. Um, you want to know what's the non-structural carbohydrate reserve in the stem and in the root system. So many of our trees have lignotubers, which is like a, a you know, reserve at the base of the tree, which is actually really difficult to sample. So we need data on how much starch reserve there is, but it is going to be, you know, I'm aware it's going to be tricky to get. Um, is there evidence that those reserves are declining? Um, I don't think so. We could go and check. I'm just thinking we have some warming experiments where there are non-structural carbohydrate reserves, which we could go and check. Off the top of my head, I don't think that we see necessarily a decline in warming. Um, there is, um, I guess there's, you know, there's this prevailing idea that respiration rates go up with temperature and that means that non-structural carbohydrates will come down. Um, but actually respiration rates acclimate acclimate massively and acclimate rapidly. And so typically what we've seen um, in the warming experiments run by my colleague, Mark Chelker, is that 
that rapid um, acclimation means that you're not necessarily seeing a decline in the non-structural carbohydrate reserve. And the fact that you've got higher CO2 concentrations may actually be potentially bolstering that reserve. Um, I have to, uh, excellent. Thanks, Belinda. This is really so exciting. I have to put one more from the recovery side of things on here. And that's by Bill, Bill Hammond. And, and, and he sort of, you know, spinning this idea further. So he, he asks whether uh, uh, thinking about these uh, uh, trees and uh, um, um, the, the, you showed that the, for them to recover, they need to build new xylem. So they need to uh, have some radial growth. So whether these recovering trees would actually be more or less less resilient to subsequent drought. And his hypothesis for more would be because they have less canopy area, but for less is because they store less carbon and less water. So, you know, how would they, how would they fare in any subsequent uh, events? Because we are, you know, we are set up to having these more frequently, I guess, in the future. Yeah, that's a really nice question, Bill. Um, and I think about that a lot. I think, you know, it really has to do with how quickly can those reserves be recovered? Um, and so <clears throat> there's some really uh, interesting research that was done during that New England dieback where they looked at um, defoliation by insects. And defoliation is a slightly different thing because you're only rebuilding your canopy, not necessarily rebuilding your xylem. Um, but typically what they were finding was that the plant could, trees could lose their canopies about three times in a row before actually dying. So they'd, you know, they'd flush, they'd get hammered, they'd flush, they'd get hammered, they'd flush, get hammered and then they'd be dead. Um, and so um, it really, I think what we really need to be looking at is the, the, the time of which it takes to replenish those reserves, how rapid is it? So these trees, you know, they will have depleted their reserves now um, once they've regrown, they'll be trying to, I assume, trying to, you know, refill those reserves as a, as a matter of priority, but I don't know how long that's going to take. Um, is it, you know, is it one year? Is it two years? Is it five years? That will really matter, um, I think. Thanks. Excellent. So um, 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 I have to pick one that sort of zooms out a little bit. Uh, and I think that's important. I mean, you mentioned about the ability to uh, predict, and I think that is super important. Uh, and there's one question by Simon Shomun who asks uh, uh, whether these predisposed, whether these trees that are stressed by drought, whether they, whether you see any signs that they are more predisposed or more at risk for being infected by uh, um, any biotic agents. So root rots, uh, um, um, any foliar uh, pathogens or, or insects. And I think that, you know, that's also probably a crucial element in, in, in thinking about predicting mortality as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I've kind of been waiting to see what happens from this last set of, uh, of, of tree death to, you know, to see if we start to see outbreaks of um, insects. Um, Certainly there's, there's, you know, there's clear evidence from a number of systems of fungal attack and borer attack following on from drought. Um, there's, uh, uh, yeah, so <laughs> there's certainly evidence that that can happen. Um, there's, it's, it's, I'm surprised that we have seen fewer insect outbreaks than I expected this past year. I kind of anticipated, because the, the thing about this epicormic foliage is that it is, you know, really, really tasty for insects. And so often you will see outbreaks on the epicormic foliage. Um, and I've, I, again, I haven't had that many reports um, but it's a, a question of, you know, maybe people haven't been out there to see it. Um, we, you know, we need to keep our eyes open to see whether that, that does happen, because it certainly can. Excellent. So we're almost running out of time. Um, I have one that sort of probably relates to that also, particularly with the, with the bugs and all the stuff. Um, um, do you see any, any big differences? And this is from Kuhn, Kuhn Kramer. Uh, do you have any, do you see any differences in uh, the way that the gymnosperms and the angiosperms respond? Ha ha. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So Australia, we don't have that many native gymnosperms, but um, we we're talking about this picture at the start. <laughs> exactly. So this, yeah, exactly. So this picture is really interesting. These are these are not native um, 
they're, they're not naturally occurring. These are planted, but they are native colitris. So the native colitris um, has incredibly resistant xylem, um, much more so than you know those those uh, the eucalypts that are around it. Um, so they do have the capacity to be more resistant. We've had a number of records though of colitris also dying um, alongside the eucalypts. So it's not, you know, it's not um, necessarily the thing that survives the best. It's also actually much less fire resistant. So um, obviously, you know, I haven't spoken about fire at all, but there's a huge fire story that goes along with this drought story. Um, and, you know, the fires really related to the, the drought. Um, uh, so the capacity of the trees to survive um, these conditions is not only related to their capacity to survive drought, but also to survive fire. Um, and so my colleague, Rachel Nolan, who's a fire expert, um, can, can talk, you know, talk more about the, the death rates of colitis after fire. Excellent. Thanks for that. So we're, we're actually out of time. I will take one more because I mean, there are so many more exciting questions, unfortunately, and I apologize to everybody who's asked questions and we couldn't uh, post them to Belinda for answering. But there's one last one that I want to bring up and that's by Daniel Nadal Sala who asks about the leaf shedding. And I think the leaf shedding, that was a, also a very exciting part of your talk. Uh, um, I'm thinking a little bit more also from an evolutionary perspective or from a plant's perspective, whether the leaf shedding is actually the consequence of drought stress or whether it's a mechanism that uh, helps trees to, to uh, avoid future water loss in order to maintain hydraulic conductivity. Yeah, it's that, you know, it's that same, that same question, is this a constraint or a feature? Um, <laughs> there's, there's, you know, Australian ecosystems are known for having leaf area, which is really well regulated, well, you know, very, very strongly correlated with rainfall. So there's a number of papers dating back to Ray Specht in the 1970s looking at how foliage projective cover varies with rainfall. So there's certainly um, a capacity of the plants to regulate leaf area with available water. Um, and so, uh, yeah, whether it's a how that actually works is a really interesting question. Um, but it, it does, it would seem to help the trees to get through drought periods for sure. That's a really interesting question, Daniel. <laughs> Sort of thing well, that's really interesting to think about. Well, that's excellent. That's probably a good a good one to end the, the to end your talk. You showed us so much that you've been that you've been uh, uh, doing, and you know so much so much new uh, uh, insights that you've been cleaning in in your work. And there's still uh, a lot of things to be discovered, I guess, uh, as we go forward. Belinda, I've certainly took a lot of things from your talk. I've learned a lot. Thanks for that. I'll hand it back over to Tom for the final words, but thanks also from my side. This was really, really amazing. Yeah, thanks, Belinda. That was absolutely fantastic. And you've, you've inspired me to go and read many more papers now than I have time to go and read. So thanks for summarizing them. Um, thanks also to Rupert for, for chairing the chat and for Cornelius, who was behind the scenes sorting out all of those questions and trying to pose them to Rupert in good order. Um, Belinda's talk will be on YouTube if you want to revisit this. Um, you can access it on our website or through our Twitter channel. You see it posted on there. Um, and likewise, there'll be another talk coming up soon in a few weeks time. So stay tuned for, um, for that. You'll find information coming out through Twitter and through the website. So thanks for joining us and good morning, good evening, good night. <laughs> Whatever time of day it is, I hope you enjoy the rest of it. <laughs> thanks all.